Jennifer, thanks for joining us after the long weekend. My pleasure. So much going on, where to start, but I have to literally start with Harvey Weinstein because today we're just hearing more and more actresses come forward, but it's really the interplay with politics that has sort of garnered the attention both inside the Beltway and without. We did see here in Rhode Island, Senator Whitehouse give his $1,000 donation to day one, the Sexual Assault and Trauma Resource Center, which actually put out their own release today regarding the donation. But there seems to be a lot of talk uh, regarding the politicians, the ones who aren't talking. Um, does Obama or do the Clintons have to say anything? Well, Hillary Clinton just released a statement within the last few minutes um, condemning what he did and saying that she's always stood up for women's rights and this is completely unacceptable. She's silent on what she's going to do with any of the money that she received from him, but at least it was the statement which frankly, I was not surprised by. The heat was really coming at her in all directions. Um, Patty Solis Doyle, who had been her campaign manager in 2008, said last night, for example, that she was shocked that Clinton had not yet said anything. Um, as far as Barack Obama or Bill Clinton or any of the other prominent Democratic male donors who have received money, my expectation is that over the course of the next 24 hours or so, we're going to start hearing from them. I think that what's a little bit different about this situation is that He's not a politician. And so, you know, the comparisons that the Republicans are making regarding the outrage toward these Democrats who have not condemned him publicly is a little bit like comparing apples to oranges. If he had been seeking the Democratic nomination for president of the United States and these Democrats didn't issue any sort of outcry, that might be a little bit more comparable. But he, you know, he did a horrible thing and he's paying a pretty substantial price. And my expectation is that more and more people will start condemning that behavior. And do you think, you know, once we continue, it's interesting, it's always that things happen almost on the show as we're talking. So as you mentioned, had not seen Hillary Clinton's statement on the issue. On the flip side, from the West Coast here and from more actresses, you know, sort of once folks have come forward and made these condemnations, address the money issue. Again, is this something that kind of Harvey Weinstein goes away because now he's essentially a persona non grata? Um, I, I mean, I think they'll continue to address the issue just because these dollars do exist, right? And they were transferred from somebody who has engaged in terrible behavior to elected officials who, for the most part, have made issues like this pretty vocal and a reason that they're running for office or serving in office. So I don't think that the issue will disappear, but I do think that... Um, you know, any sort of moral high ground that Republicans might be able to claim regarding this is going to fade pretty quickly. The other thing I would note is I just read Vernon Farrow's piece in The New Yorker, and, you know, it goes beyond just a lot of women making these allegations. Now there are explicit rape allegations as well. And so, um, you know, I, I don't think that the story is going to die, but I think the political connections to Democratic candidates are probably not going to be the most important facet of it. Well, again, it's been really uh, the center of, of media attention in the last several days, just again by the seriousness of these allegations and again the ties to the politics. So, had to ask you for your thoughts about what's going on down there. I mean, are folks talking about it at American? I, you know, I, sure, but not the, not to the same extent that they're talking about the lit. So I think that there's some attention, but not in the broad scheme of everything else that seems to be going on. Well, with everything else that seems to be going on, we just sort of skipped over what you had said there, but hopefully have you here back in good. Everything else that's going on, let's talk about the continuation of the NFL in the kneeling controversy. Mike Pence and the trip this weekend, what's the fallout from that down there? Well, I mean, I think there are two pieces that are relevant here, right? The first is that the NFL might actually now be making a rule that the players are not allowed to kneel. That would be consistent with what the Trump administration wants. But by the same token, um, you know, Mike Pence spent several hundred thousand dollars to go to a game where he stayed for 10 minutes. And I think that that fosters this narrative that the Republicans are not necessarily spending money wisely. So do we think that this issue will continue as long as there's sort of oxygen, as you mentioned, the potential rule from the NFL or the involvement interference of the Trump administration? Um, I think it'll continue to have oxygen as long as something else doesn't trump it, no pun intended, right? So as long as this can sort of be the cultural touchstone that the administration is fighting for or against, 
it'll maintain some degree of salience. Um, you know, if something else like this happens and Trump is able to resonate with the American people on another sort of non-political issue, I think this one might go away. Well, there's one battle, another one that's continuing to play out fairly publicly is the president with Senator Corker. Little, L-I-D, little, it was, that was, it was spelled L-I-D-D-L-E, yes, in, in the tweet itself. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> little. You know, I mean, I, so apparently this is one of the main reasons that he decided against choosing Corker as secretary state because he was literally too short and didn't have the stature that you need. Of course, I don't know if it's much better. He now has a secretary of state who thinks that he's a moron and has said that, you know, behind closed doors. Um, but I do think that the Corker incident just highlights that when given any kind of freedom and when given any kind of rope, Donald Trump manages to hang himself and he resorts to ad hominem attacks that we don't expect from four and five year olds. Um, you know, and it's it's behavior not becoming a president. It's behavior not becoming a preschooler. And I think that's what Bob Corker was um, suggesting. Now, the one thing that's pretty frustrating about the whole thing is that my understanding is you can find literally dozens of Republicans in Congress saying the kinds of things that Bob Corker said behind the scenes and off the record, but they lack the political courage to say them on the record. And as a result, Donald Trump continues to do exactly what he wants with very little fallout from his party. So you talk about fallout from the party was just looking online, uh, reports by political, of course, other Republicans getting fed up with this feud. Does this have implications for White House Capitol Hill relations? Again, as we're looking at tax reform. Well, it has implications for tax reform because what Donald Trump doesn't seem to be able to do is count to 51. And as a result, you know, when you alienate and isolate somebody like Bob Corker and you already have Susan Collins and usually either Rand Paul or Lisa Murkowski already not on your side, you don't have 51 votes. And so I don't know that this kind of behavior has to resonate far beyond the Corker-Trump feud in order to be very, very costly. Just a handful of people can be turned off by him and his style and what he says, separate and apart from the substance of tax reform, and tax reform goes down. So let's talk policy before we switch back to sort of optics in a second. Uh, potential for immigration reform? None. <laughs> and the reason I say that is because every time it seems like we might be making taking one step forward, we take two steps back, often via tweet. And every promise or guarantee that Donald Trump seems to suggest regarding Dreamers, regarding DACA, for example, is now sort of in, uh, you know entangled with a wall and funding for a wall that is never going to be built and can't exist. And so he's alienating and isolating the Democrats, and frankly, he needs them to get anything done on this issue. And let's talk about crossing the aisle, if you will. There were reports this week, again from Axios, about Senator Whitehouse with some other Judiciary Committee members, which might raise an eyebrow or two, going to Jared and Ivanka's for sort of a bipartisan dinner. Now, this was based on reports that were reported in Axios. Have you been hearing of this, of these bipartisan dinners taking place with Jared and Ivanka? I've got to tell you, a good friend and colleague of mine lives directly a street, across the street from them, so I'll be contacting him tonight to find out what he's seeing <laughs> out his window. But, um, I mean, I, so I hadn't heard about this. I, you know, I'm of two minds. The first is that there's nothing wrong with trying to generate some sort of bipartisan goodwill outside the chamber so that you can potentially move forward on a variety of important policy issues. The conflict here is that Jared Kushner is under investigation by multiple committees, um, including the Judiciary Committee. So that's where the perception of impropriety looks bad. I mean, if the Trump administration had major, major problems with Bill Clinton getting on Loretta Lynch's plane, <laughs> it's hard to see how this is much more uh, you know, carefully orchestrated. Well, if you read the piece by Axios, uh, the, the sources say the conversation was around Criminal justice reform, is that really on the uh, the, the hot button, the uh, hot topics list down in D.C. right now? Uh, I think among Democrats on the Judiciary Committee it probably is. but And I'm not actually arguing that that's not what they're talking about. But by the same token, I believe as well that Bill Clinton and Loretta Lynch did not discuss 
the investigation, right? So, I mean, it doesn't matter what the reality is with this administration when they're able to use it against you. Mm. When they're able to use it for themselves, then, you know, the issue is sort of moot as far as they're concerned. Now, the, the, the piece had mentioned that Jared Kushner uh, had a particular interest given his father's incarceration due to tax evasion. So, again, it was just the report was who was there. It was, again, some Democratic members from the Senate Judiciary Committee. Talk with us a little bit about the role of Axios. You know, again, after Politico, you know, they do the e-blast in the morning. Is it really kind of, was does DC need sort of an other news source? Um, I mean, I think it's sort of political gossip in a non-gossipy kind of way, if that makes sense, right? So it's political gossip, but it's information that's actually important that DC people, especially political news junkies, want to follow. So it's not necessarily only who's at whose birthday party or who is, you know, celebrating an anniversary. It's actually who's dining with whom about what. And, you know, given that so much of what goes on in D.C. happens not only inside the chambers and inside Capitol Hill, but also sort of informally at these kinds of dinners, it's, it's pretty it's pretty important. Also, as far as I'm concerned, I haven't heard of any clearly egregious examples where they've been outright wrong. The one other thing I would note is, even if Jared Kushner is interested in criminal justice reform because of his father in a white-collar prison, I'm not sure that that's the kind of criminal justice reform that Amy Klobuchar and Sheldon Whitehouse have in mind. Yeah, my, my eyebrow did go up a little bit at that mention there about Jared Kushner. I mean, I wanted to know what they had for dinner, you know, what they had to drink. <laughs> You know, the, the, the sort of, you know, really wanting to find out, but unfortunately the Senator's office uh, did not have comment on the situation when we reached out to them about the Axios report. So stay tuned for more on that. Well, I will get back to you after I have my friend look out his window. I'm going to see anything. I, he has a new part-time job as far as I'm concerned. Part-time job? We're just going to send a little camera up there, Jennifer. Why didn't you tell me this before? We're going to have, like, all eyes on the Kushners. It's going to be like Kushner 24-7 live. Like, you'll be able to, like, look out and see the kids go to school. And <laughs> we'll, we'll talk about that after. Uh, what else are we looking at this coming week, Jennifer? Um, you know, I think the two big issues are the continued fallout from Puerto Rico. Uh, you know, this is a situation where you've still got 50% of an island that has no electricity and has limited water and resources. Um, and, you know, as we talk more about Harvey Weinstein and as we talk more about immigration, as we talk more about other important policies, it's important to keep in mind that the fallout from that storm is far from over. And the other thing I think that we should be looking at pretty closely, once again, is the Mueller investigation. We didn't hear a lot about it in the last week or so, but we do know from two weeks ago that we thought within the next two or three weeks there would be some major news. So mm -hmm. I think we should keep our eyes open for that. And speaking of the major news, he's kind of cooled off of saying it, but what was Trump's line over the weekend? There's going to be something big. He kept on referring to sort of a big event. <laughs> Is it just Trump 101? I mean, I, it probably is Trump 101, and his administration seems to be brushing it off, as do Republicans in Congress. But I think as far as the American people are concerned, when you're standing there surrounded by military officers, you don't say that, you know, this is the calm before the storm, just let's wait and see, and not follow up on what wait and see means. Mm. Most people think wait and see means World War III or some kind of like nuclear holocaust, which is not necessarily the kind of environment that you want to sort of navigate while you're waiting. Uh, certainly not. All eyes on the president, as they always are. And it's always, again, a pleasure being able to pick your brain down there in D.C., Jennifer. So thank you for Skyping in. We'll talk next week. Talk to you next week. <laughs> okay, thanks.